Hello, and welcome to Hopkins at Home. Thank you for joining us. I'm Pete DiCarlo, an Associate Professor of Environmental Health and Engineering. I'm what you would call an air measurement person with additional interest in, in linking the science that we do in my group to policy outcomes. Today, we'll be talking about what's in the air you breathe with a focus on the indoor environment and a smidge of a hands-on example for you guys to maybe do uh, on your own later. We welcome you to ask any questions you have by typing them into the chat module on the screen throughout the talk and we'll leave time at the end to answer them. Now let's jump right in. The title of my talk is uh, Error Today, Gone Tomorrow. Um, and the, the basis of, of my research and in what I do in my lab is to measure the things that we can't see in our air from particles and gases. There are many different chemical components in that air that we breathe. Some we can smell, and so our nose is also a sensor in a sense. Uh, but most we cannot. And so my research group uses state-of-the-art instrumentation to chemically identify and fingerprint many of these different components so that we can better understand their sources, which is important for developing air pollution policy and link that composition to impacts like impacts to our health or how particles impact processes within the climate system. Let me give you an overview of one key instrument that's gonna kind of go through a lot of this work. And, and don't worry, I'm not gonna <laughs> expect you to be experts at this instrument at all. I just wanna kind of illustrate what this type of instrumentation looks like and how it works. So first of all, we use this high resolution aerosol uh, mass spectrometer, which is an instrument I helped develop during my PhD. It's a real time measurement, which means as the air comes in, it gets analyzed and we get real time feedback of what the chemical composition is. The, the particles that go in give us a chemical signal, which we can then link to the different sources. And a key aspect of this is it's rugged enough for field work. If I kind of open up the insides of this instrument, basically what we have is we have this inlet which brings particles in. So if I was a particle, I'd get sucked into the instrument and inside of the instrument, it's, it's under vacuum and I'd get accelerated through this expansion as you go into vacuum towards the heater that you see over here. That heater is kept at 600 degrees Celsius. So most stuff that hits that heater vaporizes and turns into a gas plume very quickly. Once we make that gas plume, we ionize that plume and we get all these crazy ions and they go through this time of flight mass spectrometer, which gives us this chemical fingerprint. Um, now that's kind of technical, but this, this instrument is forming the basis of, of a lot of the work that I'm gonna show. So I just wanted to give you guys a, a kind of a heads up, or just a, a look at what it looks like. Now we take this instrument to the field, right? It's, it's, it's rugged enough for field work. And so we take it to really clean places. And so I've been fortunate enough to receive funding from the National Science Foundation Antarctic program to take this instrument to Antarctica with me. We took it twice, 2014 and 2015. And one of the reasons we wanted to go was we wanted to understand the natural background of aerosol particles in a place where people don't really impact the air very much. And so we took it, we made measurements, and we learned over the course of these two seasons that we were down there that as the, the spring as the, the winter turns into spring and then summer, the ocean activity, the biological activity in the ocean increases some of the, the natural particles that we see in the air in a place like Antarctica. A fun fact that's me in the picture, about two months after that picture was taken, that was open water with probably orcas swimming in it looking for uh, seals to eat. Um, so it's really cool that we can take our instrument and make these measurements in these places. Another very different environment where we've also made measurements is the Kathmandu Valley. Um, many places on earth, especially urban areas, the human activities in those areas impact the air. And we get particles from things like traffic or trash burning or brick kilns. And that chemical fingerprinting that I was talking about with that instrument that we use allows us to identify those different particle types in the air that we breathe and understand how those different sources contribute to the air pollution burden in a place like the Kathmandu Valley. Once we have that knowledge, we can take that and pass it along to policymakers and, and hopefully we can try to improve air quality in many of these areas. So I guess a cool thing to think about is, is my lab, while I have one on, on Hopkins campus where all my instruments stay most of their time, 
the atmosphere is, is really the laboratory that we spend a lot of our time in and trying to understand. So it's a, it's a really fun uh, thing to do. So what, why though? Like what is the motivation for why we do the work that we're doing? So I'm gonna take a little step back and I'm gonna talk about kind of the key drivers for doing this type of research. Historically, the motivation and the funding has, has been from a need to better understand climate relevant processes in the earth system and to understand impacts of pollution on human health, including things like premature mortality or respiratory diseases and things like that. So I'm gonna start with the climate system. This is a pretty complicated figure. So I'm gonna break it down for you. This, this figure right here is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, the fifth assessment report. Uh, and, and what it is is a breakdown of the energy balance or imbalance in this case of the climate system. Um, this yellow dotted line that I've just put on the figure shows the zero line. So if there were no impacts to the climate system from activities of humans, everything would kind of be on this line. Things to the right of the line, like greenhouse gases, serve to add additional energy to the climate system by absorbing outgoing radiation, leading to an overall kind of warming that we see. So I study greenhouse gases a little bit. It's not my primary focus. Aerosols, on the other hand, aerosol particles are the, the key focus of the research within my group. And so they're down here in this blue circle. And what we see is that they actually offset to some extent the warming that we get from greenhouse gases. It's not the same magnitude, it's, it's lower, um, but they served as a counterbalance in a sense to the warming that we would otherwise have from, from greenhouse gases. And so that's, that's important to consider. Um, more aerosols would actually offset more greenhouse gases. Um, in fact, if you've heard about geoengineering ideas, many of the ideas for geoengineering actually originate from the idea that we can put aerosols specifically in different places in the atmosphere in a way to reduce the, the energy coming into the, the Earth's climate system and, and again, offset some of that greenhouse gas warming. Not necessarily a good idea, it's just kind of where those originate from. So here we're seeing that aerosols have a positive effect. The more, the more that we have, they offset these greenhouse gases and we get less warming um, and energy in the climate system. On the flip side, air pollution, particular particle pollution is, is bad for our health. The World Health Organization estimates that about 4.2 million people die prematurely per year from inhalation of air pollution and most of that due to particle pollution. Um, additionally, an extra, another 3.8 million people die per year as a result of, of household air pollution. So these are in places in the world where people either cook or heat their homes using solid fuel because they don't have access to uh, cleaner forms of energy. Um, but just beyond those two things, uh, an estimated 91% of the world's population, including the US and, and Europe and, and places with, with um, more finances, 91% of the world's population still lives in a place where air quality is considered uh, above the, the guidance from the World Health Organization. Most of this often, again, in urban areas where we have more, uh, more concentrated emissions. So outdoors, 4.2 million, indoors, 3.8 million. But that outdoor air pollution also is what impacts our indoor environment, especially in a place like the US. So quick question for you guys to think about, and then I'll keep going. Catalog your day. Think about how many hours you spend outside, COVID probably hasn't helped here either. But the bottom line is if you don't spend more than 2.5 hours outside per day, you're spending 90% of your day or more in the indoor environment. And so that outdoor air pollution, your exposure to that actually is probably happening in the indoor environment for the most part. And so that's, that's one of the things that's gonna drive the, uh, the remainder of this talk. There's a, there's a researcher in the indoor air community named Rich Corsi and he took our average life expectancy and typical activity patterns for people. And he calculated that for a 79 year life expectancy, about 69, 69 years of that 79 years, they're gonna be spent indoors. Of that 54 in your home, 26 of those years in bed, you're gonna spend about 4.3 years in vehicles and you're only gonna spend about six years outside. So again, your exposure to outdoor air pollution is probably mostly happening in the indoor environment. So the great indoors. 
there's a lot of interest now growing in this, in this area. Um, the bulk of attention has historically, again, been focused on outdoor air quality, uh, but the indoor air and better understanding the complexities of the indoor environment, which is very heterogeneous, has been growing. And recent in increases in funding in this area, uh, including a focus program from the Sloan Foundation, have really helped push this field of indoor chemistry and indoor uh, pollution forward in, in the last few years. So this again is gonna be the remainder of my talk and I'm gonna I'm focus on kind of the three key particle sources to think about or that I think are important in the indoor environment. First is that outdoor to indoor transport of air pollution. We know outdoor air pollution is bad for us. We have lots of epidemiological evidence showing that. Um, and then when we're in our homes, our activities lead to direct sources of, of air pollution. So whether we're cooking, cleaning, hopefully no one's smoking in their house anymore, um, but if they are, um, things like fireplaces, um, printers, those are also potential sources of particles that directly emit particles into that indoor space. And then there's indirect indoor sources of, of air pollution. And so things like plants or um, air freshener sprays or off-gassing from materials, furniture, um, tiles, things like that can lead to chemicals getting into the air that can then also get into the particles. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Before I, I jump in too far, I wanted to, um, to say that, you know, sometimes when you can't get to your lab, you um, start doing stuff at home. And I have this, this instrument here, it's a low cost sensor, it's called an AWARE. Um, and, I, and I recently purchased it in particular because I wanted to help uh, design a lab for students who can't be on campus um, as, as easily. And so they can't do some of the more traditional labs. And so we used low cost sensors in a way to have the students be able to take the lab home with them and do some experiments. Um, I chose this sensor because it measures quite a few things, temperature, relative humidity, particulate matter, carbon dioxide, and VOCs. And um, also because colleagues in the field have done some comparisons of various low cost sensors out there. And they found that this AWARE second edition version scored pretty high in its accuracy um, for several of the, the different parameters it measures. And that being said, there are a lot of low cost sensors you can get out there that mm, just don't quite um, cut them. Um, cut it in terms of their, their accuracy. So gave me confidence to do that, but that of course didn't stop me from doing tests myself. And so I, I took my, my trusty six, now seven-year-old um, lab assistant to help me test the 16 sensors we purchased uh, for, the, for the environmental engineering students. And we made measurements here in this, in this my, my lab away from my lab. Um, and so I thought it could be useful here to also illustrate how little things that we do in our homes can also impact our air quality in ways that we don't necessarily consider. So I'm gonna take a quick look at my AWARE sensor and I can tell you right now what the particulate matter level is in, in my special room. It is currently two micrograms per meter cubed. I don't know if you can see that, but I am going to go oh, one, down to one. Um, I'm gonna go close that door. I'm gonna turn a fan on and I'm gonna turn a humidifier on and we'll come back and revisit in a few minutes uh, what the air pollution concentration in my home is. So just give me a sec. All right, I'm back. So I close the door, which limits the amount of ventilation we can get from other parts of the house and kind of this is kind of a worst case scenario. But if you had a kid in a room and you turned the humidifier on, it'll be an example of what you can see. All right, so sidebar ended, keep going. Um, outside in. So when we take air from the outside and we bring it to the indoor environment, it brings air pollution with it. And this has been an, a, a focus area in my, in my research group now for about 10 years. Um, depending on where you live, whether you live in a home, in a row house, in an apartment, any, any type of structure will have air coming in. And, and it depends a little bit about what type of building it is. If it's a standalone home or a row house, you're typically getting air coming in through windows or doors, through um, cracks in your facade, and that's what's bringing the air pollution in. If you're living in a, in a high rise kind of building or something that has mechanical ventilation, you actively bring air into the building and distribute it uh, among the building. And so it's a little bit different, but at the same time, you're still bringing that outdoor air into your indoor environment. 
And so just to kind of give you an example of what that looks like, um, this is a, these are measurements from a classroom uh, from my PhD, my former PhD student, Anita Avery, where we looked, uh, we switched making measurements between an outdoor space and an indoor classroom environment. And we did that and we switched the inlet back and forth every few minutes so we could track concentrations outdoors and concentrations indoors. And so what you see here in this figure, this, this maroonish color is the outdoor sulfate in particles. We choose sulfate because it's really only going to come from outdoors. There's really very few indoor sources of sulfate. And so we can use that to track what's coming in from the outdoor environment. And then the brighter red color is the indoor concentration of that, that sulfate in the particles. And so what you immediately can see is that the indoor concentrations are lower by about a factor of two, and they're shifted just slightly in time. And so what we found was that that shift was about 24 minutes in the delay from taking outdoor air and getting it into that classroom. And, and that's, that's typical what we'd expect for that type of ventilation. So we're, we're actively pulling in air, we're mixing it and bringing that into classrooms. And there's about a 24 minute delay to see those, those concentrations reflected in the indoor space. Um, we can kind of do a regression analysis and, and see that the, the rough concentration difference between the outdoor and indoor environment is about 0.5. And so this is important to think about, right? We're getting about half of the outdoor concentration now in the indoor environment. And so if we were outdoors, we'd be exposed to about twice as much. Um, but again, we're spending 90% of our time indoors. So still our outdoor exposure overall is lower to outdoor average compared to our indoor exposure to outdoors. And so that's one example and one component. We also then want to look at all of the other chemical components we can, we can measure with the, the technique that I showed you early on and, and get all those different fingerprints and see what the different sources are and where they're coming from. And so we want to do that in two, two seasons too, because things that can impact how chemicals react when they're brought into the indoor environment are things like temperature. And in the winter, it's cold outside and warm inside. In the summertime, it's warm outside and cool, cooler inside. And so that temperature gradient can actually influence how chemicals partition. And so if we start with this kind of pie chart of all of the different chemical species that we can see with our instrument, that's what it looks like outdoors. And then we bring that indoors and you know, over the course of we average all the data over a month, we see that the concentration is roughly a quarter indoors compared to outdoors for this particular study. And there's a reshuffling of the chemical components of that, that particulate matter. Um, in particular, this blue color, this ammonium nitrate um, is, is high outdoors and it actually forms a much smaller fraction indoors. And this is consistent with how we understand the composition and the semi-volatile nature. I'll get to what that means a little bit later, but basically that, that component evaporates when it goes from cold outdoors to warm indoors. In the summertime, the chemical composition is a bit different. Um, you don't see much of that blue uh, to start with because it's already warmer. Um, and, the, and the overall concentration gradients uh, change as well. And so when you bring that particulate matter from the outdoor environment and bring it into the indoor environment and it's cooled down, we see a, a pretty dramatic change. And then one thing that I'll, I'll get to later in the talk is this purple fraction, which turns out to be an indoor source that we did not expect to see in these measurements, but it's something that's kind of really fascinating to, to think about. So I'll get to that uh, later in the talk. But basically in both cases, we're bringing in outdoor air, reducing its concentration by roughly a half. This is a classroom, so we don't have a lot of indoor sources. And so that kind of gives you a baseline for, you know, in the indoor environment, typically, you know, a quarter to a half of the outdoor air pollution is what we're seeing in the indoor spaces. So it's not gone and it's certainly there. And then there's other processes that can happen. So again, in the absence of indoor sources, outdoor air pollution remains the main source of those particles indoors. The next step is direct emissions, like the humidifier behind me. So let's take a quick break and, and look at what that is. So if I pull up my aware, we've only been, you know, having that, that humidifier going for about five minutes. I've got the fan going to kind of mix the air around the room. Um, but now my particulate matter concentrations are 35. So we've gone from one or two micrograms per meter cubed to uh, 35 micrograms per meter cubed, uh, 40. So they keep going up. So that, um, it's a lot, um, very quickly. And so what's basically happening is the, the dissolved solids in the tap water that I put in that humidifier are, are getting aerosolized and they're forming particles in the indoor space that, that I'm currently occupying. Um, so in addition to things like humidifiers, we have other direct sources of, 
of particulate matter and, and particles in the indoor space. One of the probably the, the most prevalent for, for many people's homes, unless you exclusively order takeout, is cooking. Um, cooking in the indoor spaces, especially if you don't turn on the, the hood above your stove, and, and especially if that hood doesn't vent outside, um, can lead to a lot of particle uh, concentration growth in the indoor spaces. It doesn't mean it's necessarily bad particles or toxic particles, you know, the composition does matter. And thinking about which ones are more toxic or less toxic or, or something that, you know, that's an active area of research that we're still looking at um, in detail. Things like cleaning, vacuuming can kick up a lot of dust and, and lead to higher concentrations. Smoking obviously is not something that anyone has been recommended to do in the indoor environment, but that's another source of particulate matter in the indoor spaces. Uh, in holiday times, I know I grew up with fires around Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I think certainly due to COVID, there's been a lot more people at home lighting fires in their home. Um, this is another source of particles in the indoor environment. And things like office equipment, printers, um, copiers, those can often lead to increases in particle concentration as well. Um, I'm going to quickly turn off the, uh, the uh, particulate um, source behind me, I, also known as the humidifier. Um, and just want to see before I do that what exactly the concentration is. 56. So we're still jumping up. All right, I'm going to turn it off. Oh, and I'm going to uh, keep all my windows closed for a little bit and let it sit. And then I'll, you know, in the next section, I'll actually open a window and we can hopefully see that ventilation occur in, in, in real time. All right, so um, indoor sources, cooking, one of the key ones. Um, I'm going to show you a simulated Thanksgiving meal. Um, as part of a, a large multi-group, PIs from the US, Canada, all over, um, came together to a test house, a dedicated test house uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. And we set up about $4 million worth of instrumentation. There were groups from all over, and my group was lucky to participate in this, and, and measured the concentration in, of various gases and chemical uh, particles in the house when we did certain activities. One of those activities was to recreate a Thanksgiving dinner uh, in June in Austin, which was a little warm. Um, and what I'm showing you here is what the total particulate matter mass which was almost all organic, looked like as kind of a time profile over that day. And so actually the, the researchers, student researchers, made breakfast in the morning, cleaned up a little bit, and then started doing their Thanksgiving preparations, which you know, as a, for all of you who have made Thanksgiving dinner is a all day activity. And this is data from my, my former student, Aaron Katz, um, showing kind of what we measured. So I told you that, that our instrument does chemical fingerprinting, and this is an example of what I mean by that. So we can use that complex data that we're generating with our instrument, this mass spectral data, and separate it out into chemical signatures of different species. And so we've separated here into four different factors using a mathematical technique um, to, to deconvolute these things. And the first factor that we see in this darkest color is kind of a burning chemical signature. Uh, it, looks, it looks similar chemically to what we see with wood burning outdoors. Um, this second factor is, is kind of a saturated fat signature. So it's, it's again, a relatively small component of the total, but it's, it's, it's large enough to be pulled out and seen. Uh, this factor three, which I've bolded here, is, is similar to vegetable oil. So if we actually just take straight vegetable oil and put it into our instrument, it has a very similar chemical signature to this. And then this fourth factor is actually linked to when we're using the oven. And we know a lot of this because when you're doing these things as a controlled experiment, you take detailed notes of which activity is happening at, at which particular time. Um, and so this detailed activity log of what was happening at a precise moment in time really is great in identifying which activities are linked to those chemical signatures. And so there's a couple that really are, are pretty easy to spot. Um, when the pie was being taken out of the oven, uh, a little bit of the juice kind of fell on the door and it, it, it didn't flare, it didn't catch on fire, but it definitely burned. And we saw a big increase in particle concentration when that happened. And you can see the, the pie drippings burn error here. A little bit later, one of the uh, student researchers left an oven middle a little too close to the flame and it 
caught the tip on fire, you got another little pulse particles coming in, you can see that those things decay over time. Things like the pie going in the oven shows this increase in this dotted character. And then when the turkey goes in the oven, we see the slight increase. We put Brussels sprouts in the oven, we see a larger increase. And so anytime the oven is in use, we see this dotted factor go up. And so we can start to link the chemical fingerprints that we're seeing with our instrument with those activities that are happening as we, as the researchers cooked a, a Thanksgiving dinner in, in, in this test house in Austin. And so the other thing to think about is once everything stopped right around four o'clock, um, we still have this kind of long tail of decay. Um, and so what happened was it takes a while for those particles that have been generated through this cooking activity throughout the day to be ventilated um, and to go outside. Um, and so that's the kind of decay time scale of particles and the air being overturned in the house and getting us back down to levels that are more typical um, in non-cooking or non-source times. And so with that being said, I'm gonna take another peek at my air quality in this room. I don't think it's probably changed very much. I just got an announcement that I have bad air quality. We're down to 42, so not that much decay um, compared to, or 47, I'm sorry, not that much decay. Uh, compared to what it was at, at 56. Um, so I'm gonna take a quick uh, second to open a window and that will help drop things down much, much faster. All right, I just opened a window next to me and that should help ventilate the air out, which is exactly what, if you want to remove bad particles from your space, what you should be doing. So I think most people intuitively know this. For anyone who's burned something in the kitchen, in the oven, or on the stove, you rush and you open a window, you open a door and try to get that air mixed. And so I think intuitively we know that, you know, in cases where we're very keenly aware of the high particle concentrations, we know to ventilate. We just don't always do it uh, in, in times when we don't sense that the particle concentrations are quite high. So cooking obviously is, is one source of indoor particles that um, are directly emitted into the indoor space. And we just went through kind of a simulated Thanksgiving dinner, which is a bit extreme, but it's, it's a good illustrative example of, of how the activities of cooking in our, in our kitchens lead to some increased particle loads. Other sources that can also lead to total particle load, um, 3D printers. Um, I threw this in here because my group in collaboration with a few others uh, looked at emissions from 3D printers used in an undergraduate uh, teaching lab. And what we found were um, particles look like little agglomerations of little plastic balls. Um, we could look at them chemically with my instrument and get their fingerprint and uh, with microscopy. Um, fortunately, I know a very good microscopist who I'm married to is also a professor at Hopkins. Um, and she did the microscopy for us. And we have this great image of what a 3D printer particle looks like. Uh, when it's emitted during a 3D printing process. And so with this increasing popularity and the lower price point for many consumer models of 3D printers, a lot of people are starting to put these in their homes. Um, and that's probably not the best idea. And if you do have one in your home or you're thinking about it, you open a window, don't be in there when it's printing and make sure you have a fan blowing all that air out because you really don't wanna breathe these little plastic particles into your lungs. Our bodies don't digest them very well. Um, Worse, in my opinion, is the fact that they're marketing 3D printers as gifts for kids. Um, so definitely, even if you want to, don't buy your kids or your niece or your nephew or your grandkids a 3D printer. It's probably not going to be the best idea for their health. Um, and they can use them in a, in a different space or have someone else print them for them. But in the event you have one, make sure that you ventilate. Open a window, minimize your exposure. Um, and, and try to avoid these direct particle uh, inhalation events uh, when you're printing something with your 3D printer. And so those are just a couple examples of direct emissions. There's other things, again, um, smoking is one, um, cleaning can be another. I don't have time to go through all of them, but just think of those as, as potential uh, other direct sources that, that you wanna try to minimize or ventilate after you, you emit particles into that indoor space. So moving on, kind of the least intuitive um, way in which mass gets added to the particle population in, a, in an indoor environment is through indirect sources. 
Um, there are things like chemical reactions that can occur. So if you spray something like a Glade air freshener, um, the chemicals in there can react with ozone, which is an air pollutant that would, again, comes in from outdoors and generate more particles or other chemicals, which then want to be in the particle phase and not in the gas phase. And so those particles will then collect and absorb those chemicals and grow their mass. We also have things like off-gassing. So smells associated with, you know, that new car smell or new furniture. When you get a new mattress, you can smell kind of the off-gassing of that. Those are chemicals that are what we call semi-volatile, right? So they're, they're attached to something initially, but, but the fact that we can smell them means they left that surface and they got into the air, they got into our nose and, and we could smell it. And so there's a lot of chemicals out there that are semi-volatile, that, that partition back and forth between surfaces and the air that we breathe. Those chemicals can also then get into particles in the same, in the same way that they get onto surfaces. And so we can identify a lot of these chemicals coming into particles using the, the techniques that we have with these complicated instruments that we use in, in my group and, and others as well. And so one thing that was really surprising, and this is something that I'm gonna talk about now, is that that purple slice of the summertime indoor air pollution, this purple wedge is roughly a quarter of the total particulate matter indoors. I'm calling it third hand smoke, and I'll explain to you what that means shortly. Um, but it is not originating from outdoors, it's originating from indoors, and we're in a classroom without a lot of other sources. And so, you know, first of all, I think the question I always get is what is third hand smoke? Um, and just very, very briefly, you know, someone smoking get it, is getting what the primary smoke, the direct smoke is going straight to that person into their lungs through the cigarette. Secondhand smoke, I think everyone's familiar with. It's, it's the person, it's the people who are standing nearby to the smoker are breathing the smoke that's coming from the cigarette, but they're not the ones that are smoking. So thirdhand smoke is that persistent residue after the smoking has occurred. That's either on the clothes, on surfaces, but it's the residue left behind from that smoking event, even when the smoke in the air is all gone. And I think a lot of people are familiar with with that, if especially the older generation, you know, if you've been to a bar and someone's smoking or a place where someone's smoking and it's on your clothes, you can smell it for days. And again, this is that semi-volatile nature, right? It's, it's attached to our clothing, but the fact that we can smell it with our nose means that some of it is coming off at some rate, getting into the air, getting into our nose and we're smelling it. And so third-hand smoke is coming from surfaces, surfaces that have been impacted by the smoke where it gets deposited so in a non-smoking environment like a classroom which hasn't which has been in a, which is in a non-smoking building for 30 years where does that come from well it turns in it turns out it can come in with smokers or it can come in through a window from the outside um, but a really interesting study published i think a year or two ago showed that um, in germany they made measurements in a movie theater and a lot of people take a smoke break right before the movie started and then they'd come into the theater after the, after smoking outside and bring a lot of that those chemicals from the cigarette that they smoked outside in with them and it was interesting they had a correlation between r-rated movies which all adults and g-rated movies for family and the increase in those smoking related chemicals before the r-rated movies was pretty big and in the smoking related chemicals before the g-rated movies was quite a bit smaller and so what they showed was this you know, influx and then over the course of the film, you'd see this decrease with those chemicals associated with smoking throughout the film. And so it was really just this, everyone going out to smoke before the film, coming and bringing those with them. And so you can bring this third hand smoke into the indoor environment just on your clothes and lead to pretty high concentrations. Now, the question is how does it get into particles? Again, this is making up a quarter of the particles in our indoor space that we measured in a classroom. Um, you know, the residue sticks around. So people bring it in on their clothes and then they sit down in a chair, it gets on surfaces, it gets on desks, and it will slowly come off. But for it to make up almost a quarter of the particle mass, it also has to be kind of taken up really quickly and stuck in there. And so what turns out is there's some interesting chemistry behind that. And in the summertime, when you go through a, when you go through a ventilation system, you, you add water to the particles. Um, it goes through the cooling coil and the particles basically get a little wet 
And that water allows the uptake of some of these chemical species and reaction in the particles so that they're locked in. We don't see it in the winter time because in the winter time you go through a heater and you heat everything up and you basically dry everything out. You lose the water from those particles and you can't, you can't have that reactive uptake in the winter time when there's no water present. You only get that in the summertime. And so we actually saw a seasonal difference in third hand smoke in the indoor environment. And for, fourthly, the fourth key point here is, you know, to really convince ourselves that this is the phenomenon, this was actually like residual cigarette smoke coming into a non-smoking environment and then getting back into the particles, we wanted to simulate this in a lab. And so this is something that we did where we went into my lab, we smoked a cigarette in, in the hood, ventilated outdoors, very, very, very scientific. Nobody actually smoked themselves. Um, and we pulled the smoke from that cigarette into a glass jar. That allowed us to kind of get some of those smoke particles to deposit on the surfaces of the jar. And then once we did that for about you know, a minute or two, we basically pushed clean air through the jar overnight and blew all the smoke away. So there was no smoke left in that jar. The only thing left in that jar was the residue that deposited on the side of the jars, sides of the jar, when we put that smoke in initially. And then we simulated the classroom. So we took outdoor air and we piped it through our little smoke filled, smoky residue jar. Um, and we measured particles after they had passed the jar and we measured particles before they went into the jar. And we could compare the chemical signatures and look for that chemical fingerprint with our instrument of that residual cigarette smoke. And we saw it and it looked like it did in the classroom after we aged the smoke for about a week. So a week after we deposited, that smoky residue was still um, outputting these chemicals and making it look like uh, the, what we saw in the classroom. And so that was kind of that, that final kind of nail in the coffin, really nailing down that this was due to residual cigarette smoke. You know, this area of research has generated a lot of uh, questions. I get emails from people uh, from the work that we've published asking, you know, I just bought a house and I think the previous owner smoked in it and how do I deal with that? Um, we even got uh, me and another colleague were asked to consult for um, this old house and they had a session on how do you remediate if you even can remediate third hand smoke and what that means um, to, to a home buyer, like what are the costs associated with it and what are the procedures for doing so. Um, you know, an interesting thing that's come out is, you know, there's no requirement to include any information about smoking history in, in a home in, in a seller's disclosure. And I think this is, you know, an interesting question about whether that's important or not. We know that there are health impacts from lab testing from third hand smoke. And so it's something, you know, we might want to consider. We, we have to disclose lead and other things in, in homes. We don't have to disclose, disclose other chemicals like uh, third hand smoke or a smoking history of the house. Um, and so that's one way that these indirect, you know, these aren't direct particle emissions, but these are chemicals that are on surfaces that get off the surface and get into the particles and into the particles that we're breathing in the indoor space. And so that's, that's one example. Another kind of interesting example um, is people as reactors. All of us have skin oils. And again, ozone is this oxidant chemical that comes in from outside. And it's a, it's a chemical uh, reactant. It's, it will oxidize things and, and make um, new chemical products. And so what we found was that when we have a lot of people in a room and there's some ozone coming in from outside, we get a signature of people, people skin re oil reactions with ozone and that actually contributing to the particles that we breathe indoors. And so we observed this phenomenon. We did a, a pretty detailed analysis and tried to really understand it as best we could. And we developed a fingerprint for what our skin oil reactions with ozone look like. And keep in mind, you're covered in skin oil. And so that, those reactions are occurring kind of on your body and then you're probably breathing some of your own uh, skin oil reactions. Um, before I move on, I just want to quickly take a check. Um, I have the window open. I've had it open about the same amount of time as before. And our PM level is now down to 15. So we dropped about 10 micrograms per meter cubed um, after I turned the humidifier off for about five minutes. And now we are down um, another 30 micrograms per meter cubed just by having that window open. And so again, opening a window and increasing ventilation helps drop uh, chemical exposure in the indoor environment by flushing out bad uh, particles that we may have been generating from our humidifier. I'm gonna turn that fan off. 
Um, and be right back. I'll leave the window open. It's nice outside today. All right. So getting back to people as reactors. Um, this was kind of a fun way to examine um, kind of what goes on in our indoor spaces. And again, this was based in a classroom study. Um, what we have here in this plot is kind of the CO2 difference. And so the higher the CO2 level, the more people. People emit CO2 when we breathe. And if you're in an enclosed indoor space, the CO2 levels will rise um, with occupancy. Um, and so with more people and a higher CO2, we're seeing an increase in the ozone removal rate. An ozone removal rate is basically the ozone reacting with things in that space. And so more people leads to more reactions. And we did a detailed analysis and started to pull out those chemical fingerprints of what was increasing when we saw the higher occupancy and more ozone reacted, we got a signature, a chemical signature that looks like this. And so this is basically the chemical signature that, that we see with our instrument for when our skin oil reacts with ozone. It's a little bit gross. Um, so pro tip, there's a lot of marketing out there for using an ozone cleaner in an indoor space, but ozone is a pollutant. So you probably want to avoid any product that advertises ozone as, it's, as a cleaner for your, your indoor spaces. It's, it's not good for your lungs. It's not good for generating more reactions such as this with your skin oil. Um, avoid, um, highly recommended to avoid. So the next piece, um, I, I, you know, it is, it is the, a global pandemic right now. Um, there's growing recognition finally now from, from the World Health Organization that, that COVID is airborne, which is something that many scientists in my field have been saying for, for months and months and months. And, and that means indoor spaces are a key transmission route. CO2, which I just showed you, is a marker for occupancy. Um, and it, it, it goes up when you're in an enclosed space indoors. When you're outdoors, the CO2 levels don't get to the indoor levels that we can get to um, because you get almost infinite dilution very quickly. If there's any kind of breeze, you dilute things very, very quickly. So one of the scientific recommendations for minimizing risk if you're in an indoor space is to have about five air changes per hour. So basically taking the volume of the air in a room and exchanging that completely about five times per hour. And that helps keep, if there is viral load from someone who maybe is asymptomatic, down to a, a much lower risk level. Ultimately, it's best to be outdoors and with the spring weather that we're having right now, it's a great time to be outdoors. Um, but if you are indoors, if you do have people that you don't live with that are in, in an indoor space, highly recommend that you ventilate, open windows, fans on. And just like I flushed all those particles out just by opening a window, you can do the same thing with, with viral particles. Ultimately, a particle is a particle, whether it's a viral particle or an air pollution particle, they follow the same physics. And if we want to remove them, we know how to do it. We open windows, we use fans, and we try to ventilate. But again, best to probably be outside. I can show you some, some kind of fun data that we, we took, again, with our little aware. Um, and in the testing that I did for the, for the lab to make sure everything was working, I used my uh, bike tire inflator, which is a little CO2 cartridge, and I sprayed it in the indoor space. And then I got out had all the windows and doors closed, had the fan going to kind of keep things mixed. And what you can do is you can look at that, you know, initial input of CO2, which I, you know, spraying all that CO2 in the room, got to a high concentration, and then watching the concentration levels drop. This follows what we would consider a decaying exponential. And you can fit a function to that. And it tells you the time constant for how many air exchanges you're gonna get per hour. So ultimately with all of my windows closed, with the fan going and the door closed, I got about 1.6 air changes per hour. So the, the volume of this room through leaks in the windows or under the door was only ventilating about one and a half, one and a half times this volume per hour. Now, when I opened a window, I got over that, that five air changes per hour threshold. So if I were to have you know, people in this room with me who I, I didn't live with and I was worried about risk, I, I'd want at least one window open and maybe probably a fan going. Um, and so that, that CO2 loss is, is really only from this kind of air exchange rate. And it's really kind of a, a cool way to use these low cost sensors and, and understand the indoor spaces that we're in and how that might um, lower risk, especially again, during this kind of global pandemic that we've been experiencing. So fundamentally, really hitting kind of the end and I just wanted to 
hammer on these, these take home points. Air pollution, whether it be outdoors or indoors can be harmful to, to health. And so ultimately we wanna minimize our exposure. If it's outdoors, you wanna minimize sources. And there's been a lot of more historic research on outdoor air pollution. So I think we understand that a lot better. In the indoor environment, there's about three sort, there's really three main sources of particle pollution. And that is outdoor air coming in, those direct emissions from things like cooking, smoking, cleaning, and that indirect emissions, the off-gassing, the chemical reactions, third-hand smoke, um, skin oil reactions with ozone. To minimize concentrations, especially indoors, we wanna ventilate. We wanna get those particles out, especially when we have a high concentration from cooking or, or whatever activities might be going on. And again, those same ventilation principles occur or uh, apply for COVID. Um, but also just wear a mask, uh, especially in, in public spaces. So with that, I wanted to say thank you for listening. Um, I'm gonna throw this last graphic up. I wanna also acknowledge that you know funding that I've received from the National Science Foundation and the Sloan Foundation, which has helped uh, with some of the results I presented here today. And I'm, I'm happy to have uh, questions from the audience. So I see there's a couple here already. Um, I have one question of how, we, how can we significantly improve our indoor air quality besides having plants and air purifiers at home, especially during the pandemic when we are mostly forced to stay at home? Um, great question. I mean, an air purifier is, is gonna be way better than a plant. Um, you'd essentially need to cover your entire indoor space with plants for them to have much of an impact, unfortunately. Plants are great, don't get me wrong, for kind of just the mental health aspect. I think we all feel better when we see living things around us. Um, but if you really wanna clean your air, the air purifier is definitely the way to go. Um, other ways to improve indoor air quality, um, you know, if you're cooking, ventilate. Uh, use your stove vent fan if you can. Minimize those indoor sources. You know, try to stay away from essential oils. Try not to make fires in the indoor space. Candles are probably a bad idea. I know my wife hates me when I say all this stuff, but um, the reality is all of those are particle sources that can lead to higher concentrations in the indoor space. So, you know, again, minimizing sources is one way to, to definitely uh, improve that indoor air quality. Um, but do so in, in a way that, that makes you feel comfortable as well. Um, I have a question, um, have COVID related restrictions had a large or lasting impact on overall air pollution? It's a great question, Tony. I think there's a lot of um, people out there who are studying this, including my group. Um, we've looked at this and the things that we have to disentangle are seasonal differences and year to year differences in meteorology. But even doing that, yeah, we've definitely seen, especially during the lockdowns, a pretty large decrease in um, pollution related to traffic not surprising, right? Um, but overall, you know, greenhouse gas emissions didn't really decrease that much. In fact, they continued to rise even during these lockdowns. And so traffic pollution for greenhouse gases are still not, um, not the major source. Um, and certainly we've bounced back. Um, I think the other part of that question was the lasting impact. Um, we have gone back to driving. We are out and about more often um, and I think the overall levels of air pollution are, are kind of back to where they were. I mean, overall, historically, since the Clean Air Act in 1970 and um, you know, amendments in 1990, 96, we've seen a, a large trend in decreasing um, outdoor air pollution. Um, and I, I expect those to kind of continue as, as those trends to continue, especially with you know improvements in vehicle technology. That's been a big driver for a lot of those decreases in outdoor air pollution. Um, but yeah, I, I don't see any evidence that, that any relate, any COVID decreases in air pollution ha will have a lasting effect. It seems like we're, we're pretty much back to where we were before. Um, another question from Carrie, uh, what do you think about mask wearing to improve health outcomes due to air quality? Um, are there places in the US that could benefit from continued mask wearing? <sighs> um, Anytime you reduce your uh, exposure to particles, it's, it's gonna be a net benefit. And so even masks that only drop 10% of the total particle load that you're breathing will have a benefit. But at, at, at some question, it's a quality of life question. Um, do you wanna wear masks if you're not in a global pandemic? Um, or would you, would you prefer to wear one? I mean, I think we've had discussions in my house, my wife and I have talked about, you know, we have little kids uh, and they weren't nearly as sick this winter, probably because they were wearing masks around friends and they weren't getting all those respiratory infections that we always see every, every winter. 
Um, and so maybe there is, you know, maybe that is a lasting change that there will be, you know, more mask wearing, or if someone feels a little bit off, they'll wear a mask. And, and maybe that is a, maybe that is something that will be a lasting benefit. Um, it's certainly more common and more socially acceptable in, in Asian countries for people to wear masks. And, and maybe we will at least have some subset of the population that will do that as well. It's unclear. Um, I have a question on aerosol mists. Um, are mist aerosols of water vapor necessarily bad for you? Uh, that's a good question, Steve. Uh, so if you're referring to the humidifier and the, the ultrasonic humidifier that I had on behind me, um, most of the particles that come out initially are made of water. Once they're in the air, the relative humidity is low enough that the water on those particles evaporates. And then at the core of every one of those water particles and the aerosol mist that you're calling it is a seed of something that's not water. You have to have some solid mass or something else in there for that water to condense onto to come out. And so what those aerosol mists leave behind are the total dissolved solids in the, in the water that, that you use in the humidifier. Or if there's any salts that are dissolved in there, those will form that kind of core that's left over. And so is that bad for you? Well, it depends on what's in the water, first of all. Um, if, it's, if it's tap water, you're talking probably about some calcium um, precipitates and things like that. And, and you, I don't necessarily wanna breathe all those into my, into my lungs because you know, those are things that my body has to then break down and then take out of the body. Um, so, you know, the jury's, the, the water vapor, the, the degree that which they, to, they might be bad for you depends on kind of what's in that water to start with. And so it's not necessarily bad for you, but it's not necessarily good for you. And if you use distilled water, deionized water, you're going to get a lot less of that um, extra particles left behind. Um, so that might be a way to, to go. Um, Renee asks about really wanting to use a humidifier but can't commit to purchasing distilled water, are there any ways to purify water for use in a humidifier as an alternative to purchasing distilled? Um, that's a great question, Renee. The other option is you can also get um, basically humidifiers that heat up the water and evaporate the water. And those humidifiers do not have the same particle emissions that the ultrasonic mist humidifiers do. Um, it's a, it's a bit of a question of safety at that point because you have now a hot water reservoir. And if you have small children who are prone to like pulling at cords or, or doing other things, you wanna make sure that it's in a safe place away from them. If you're not worried about, if you don't have small children and it's just for you, um, I, would, I would strongly recommend using a hot water humidifier as opposed to an ultrasonic humidifier. Um, it just, uh, it's what we did with our, with our children um, after I learned kind of about the, the humidifiers and made some measurements. Um, question from Curtis. Uh, are UV light air purifiers and HVAC systems effective or backed by any science? Yes, uh, I think UV is something that has been studied for a lot longer. Um, they have effective, they are, they have some efficacy. Ultimately, the most effective is better filtration um, or more ventilation with outdoor air. But UV lights have been used and can be used in HVAC systems um, for an additional small increase in um, protection. I, I, I think that the better investment personally is in better filtration for the HVAC system or increasing the amount of outdoor ventilation air that you have. Um, Danielle asked about people with outdoor allergies. Um, is it better to ventilate or run an air purifier with a HEPA filter? Um, if it's high pollen, I would probably keep my windows and doors closed if I had allergies and use an indoor HEPA filter. Um, that's going to be your best bet in terms of minimizing that, that, um, that exposure in your indoor space. When it's not pollen, excuse me, when it's not pollen season, um, a little more fresh air is, is never a bad thing. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, certainly something to think about. Um, and I would, I would suggest that the HEPA filter probably as your best, uh, best remedy against, against pollen. Ed asks about opening windows when the air outside is polluted. You know, that is, that is definitely a, um, question I get a lot. Um, I think the question is in a sense, when 
is it most polluted? When do you have the least amount of outdoor air pollution? Um, and there are certainly time, time of day uh, impacts here. The, the overall levels that we, we see in the US and under normal days, it's, it's, not, it's not that awful in a sense. They're, they're, most days are, are pretty clean. And I think we're pretty cognizant of when we have bad air pollution. You can kind of see it when the skyline gets hazy. That, that's basically when the, the outdoor air pollution is the worst in terms of particle pollution, because those particles kind of scatter light and, and make the you know, downtown areas not look as crisp. Um, uh, I think it's important to open windows, um, at least occasionally to get kind of vent things out. Um, so I wouldn't recommend to keep your house shut all the time, but um, certainly do it when, when concentrations are low or when you can check on that. And there are, there are websites dedicated to, you know, airnow.gov is basically your, your air pollution forecast. Um, where you can go online and, and see kind of what the real time concentrations are and whether it's a good day or a bad day. And so, you know, if it's a good day, it definitely shouldn't stop you from opening your windows and letting in some outdoor air. Uh, question from Fred. Uh, if we're trying to calculate clean air changes per hour with UVGI disinfection, is there a way to account for the UVGI contribution since particular CO2 measurements wouldn't reflect it? Um, <sighs> so you have to you have to estimate an efficacy for your um, ultraviolet because it's not 100%, um, and that's contact time with the light uh, illumination fraction. Um, so you're right. The um, you'd have to you basically have to add that extra factor into your um, clean kind of clean air change. Uh, calculation. It's, yeah, basically, you would just need to better best understand your HVAC system and the contact time the air is having with your UV uh, radiation. Again, ultimately, I think the particulate measurement is probably still your best bet. Um, because that that's going to be reflective of how much particular is getting filtered out when you go through a, hopefully a, a pretty high rated filter. And really that's gonna be where you get the best bang for your buck in terms of reduction in risk. Um, question or a comment from James. Um, different 3D printers materials have different emissions. Is there a material you'd recommend that is least toxic? Um, certainly from the, the materials that, that we looked at, um, the, uh, what is it, the, um, ABS is not what I would recommend. That's kind of the hard plastic, but there's another um, polylactic acid uh, material, which from our experience had less emissions of particles, overall emissions. Um, and there were, um, those are more of a biomolecule that your body should better be able to break down than kind of the, uh, the, the ABS, the ABS filament type. Um, Again, I don't necessarily recommend using 3D printers, especially indoors, um, but if you do, yeah, the uh, polylactic acid PLA uh, filaments were, were lower emitting and um, probably less harmful from a toxicology perspective. Um, follow up from Steve. Most all liquid aerosols have a droplet nuclei, i.e. Uh, using deionized water. Uh, yes, um, unless you're incredibly super saturated, um, you basically need a surface for water to condense onto. And so that requires um, particle, uh, a particle core. Um, and so for that, um, we definitely see, you know, we did, we did experiments um, previously where we looked at the total dissolved solid content of um, humidifiers. And we found that the, um, the lower the total dissolved solid, the, the fewer particle residuals were left or the lower mass that we got. And so um, pretty much all of these liquid aerosols will have some kind of residual uh, mass on the inside. Now, depending on how concentrated the solution is, it's, it's not gonna be very much, but there'll be some. Then Nancy asks, would fabric masks worn for COVID have protector from new car smells or other than off casting until they go away? Unfortunately, um, masks and fabric, fabric masks are good for filtering uh, particles. Um, you can get some masks that have charcoal, activated charcoal inserts. 
And so what that is, is that's basically um, activated carbon, which absorbs some of those VOCs. And so if you want to protect from those new copper smells, you'd want to get one of those charcoal inserts that will absorb some of those VOC things, but you're going to have to replace that um, insert relatively frequently to, uh, to keep it from, from basically soaking up those, those gas-based chemicals. And then I think Alan asks about air pollution from China reaching people in California. And the answer is yes. Um, it, it isn't as concentrated as it was in China. It dilutes on the way over and a lot of the kind of uh, atmospheric mechanisms, sorry, there's, I don't know if you guys can hear it, but someone's doing lawn work and I'm gonna close the window. All right, back quickly. Um, the, the mechanisms by which it, it gets transported, basically it has to go up through a thunderstorm, get high in the atmosphere and then come back down uh, on the west coast of the US. And when that happens, um, you lose a lot of the air pollution in that process. So yes, there's definitely times when we've noticed um, air pollution in China coming to California. I was part of an experiment during my PhD where um, we looked at that uh, particular phenomenon and we definitely saw it, but it was very low concentration compared to kind of what you'd be in China or, or typical, what's typical in, in California. The last couple of questions. John asks if there's a commercially viable way to measure third-hand smoke in the home. No, I would love to try to develop that. We've had some ideas. We just haven't been able to, to pursue them right now, but, but certainly, um, I mean, there are, I, I take that back. Measuring nicotine on surfaces is certainly a way to do that. But third-hand smoke is very pervasive and it's inside of walls, it's in insulation, it's in ventilation system. And so measuring, measuring it to know that it's there is, is done with kind of surface wipes and nicotine, but quantifying the extent of the third-hand smoke in the home is, is, a, is a bit more challenging. Um, Anna asks, how might shift towards vaping impact persistent particles from smoking second and third hand smoke? Great question. We are doing some of that work in my lab right now and looking at um, residual vape particles um, and how that may contribute to indoor, uh, indoor particle concentrations. So stay tuned. Maybe I'll have another lecture at some point where I can discuss the, uh, the vaping, which, which does tend to happen more in the indoor environment these days than smoking. So great question. Thank you. And thank you all. I think uh, that's, that's it for the questions. It was my pleasure to kind of share the, the work that we do in my lab with you. Thank you.